of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. A kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the wall I carry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirit that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon. Since a crooked figure may attest in little place a million, and let us cipher to this greater comp on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies, whose high uprearied and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hoops in the receiving earth. What is your thought that now must deck our king? Carry them here and there. Jumping all times, turning the accomplishments of many years into an hourglass. For the which supply, admit me, chorus to this history, who prologue like your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. <laughs> Where is my gracious lord of Canterbury? Not here, in present. Send for him, good uncle. Shall we call in ambassadors, my liege? Not yet, my cousin. We would be resolved before we hear them of some things of weight that task our thoughts concerning us and France. God and his angels guard your sacred throne and make you long become it. Sure, we thank you. My learned lord, we pray you to proceed and justly and religiously unfold why the law Salic that they have in France or should or should not bar us in our claim. And God forbid, my dear and faithful lord, that you should fashion, rest, or bow your reading, or nicely charge your understanding soul with opening titles miscreate, whose right suits not in native colors with the truth. For God doth know how many now in health shall drop their blood in approbation of what your reverence shall incite us to. Therefore take heed how you impawn our person, how you awake our sleeping sword of war. We charge you in the name of God. Take heed. Then hear me, gracious sovereign, and you peers that owe yourselves your lives and services to this imperial throne. There is no bar to make against your highness claim to France but this, which they produce from Faramond. In terram salicem mulieres ne succedant. No woman shall succeed in Salic land. Which Salic land the French unjustly glows to be the realm of France, and Faramond the founder of this law and female bar. Yet, their own authors faithfully affirm that the land Salic is in Germany, between the floods of Sela and of Elbe, uh, where Charles the Great, having subdued the Saxons, they are left behind and settled certain French, who, holding in disdain the German women for some uh, dishonest manners of their life, established then this law, to wit, 
No female should be an heretrix in Salic land, which Salic, as I said, twixt Elbe and Sela, is at this day in Germany called Meisen. Then doth it well appear the Salic law was not devised for the realm of France, nor did the French possess the Salic land till 401 and 20 years after uh, defunction of King Faramond. Besides, their writers say uh, King Pepin, being descended of Blithild, who was daughter to King Clothair, made claim and title to the throne of France. Uh, Hugh Capet also, who uh, usurped the throne, conveyed himself as the heir to the Lady Lingar. Also, uh, King Louis X, uh, sole heir to this usurper Capet, uh, could not keep quiet in his conscience wearing the crown of France till satisfied that fair Queen Isabel, his grandmother, was lineal of the Lady Ermengarde. So, that as clear as is the summer sun, King Pepin's title and Hugh Capet's claim, King Louis's satisfaction, all appear to hold in right and title of the female. <laughs> May I, with right and conscience, make this claim? The sin upon my head, dread sovereign, for in the book of numbers is it writ, when the man dies, let the inheritance descend unto the daughter. Gracious Lord, stand for your own, unwind your bloody flag, look back into your mighty ancestors. They know your grace hath cause and means and might, so hath your highness. Never king of England had nobles richer or more loyal subjects, whose hearts have left their bodies here in England and lie pavilioned in the fields of France. Oh, let their bodies follow my dear liege with blood and sword and fire to win your right. In aid whereof, uh, we of the spirituality will raise your highness such a mighty sum as never did the clergy at one time bring in to any of your ancestors. Call in the messengers sent from the Dauphin. Now are we well resolved, and by God's help and yours, the noble sinews of our power. France being ours, we'll bend it to our awe, or break it all to pieces. Or there we'll sit, or lay these bones in an unworthy urn, tombless with no remembrance over them. Now, are we well prepared to know the pleasure of our fair cousin, Dauphin? For we hear your greeting is from him, not from the king. May it please your majesty to give us leave freely to render what we have in charge? Or shall we sparingly show you far off the Dauphin's meanings and our embassy? <laughs> we are no tyrant, but a Christian king. Therefore, with frank and with uncurbed plainness, tell us the Dauphin's mind. Thus, then, in few. Your Highness, lately sending into France, did claim some certain dukedoms in the right of your great predecessor, King Edward III. In answer of which claim, the Prince, our master, says that you savour too much of your youth and bids you be advised there's naught in France that can be with a nimble galliard one. You cannot revel into dukedoms there. He therefore sends you, metre for your spirit, this ton of treasure. And in lieu of this, desires you let the dukedoms that you claim hear no more of you. This the Dauphin speaks. What treasure, uncle? Tennis balls, my liege. We are glad the Dauphin is so pleasant with us. His present and your pains we thank you for. When we have matched our rackets to these balls, we will in France, by God's grace, play a set shall strike his father's crown into the hazard. Tell him he hath made a match with such a wrangler 
that all the courts of France shall be disturbed with chases. And we understand him well, how he comes o'er us with our wilder days, not measuring what use we made of them. But tell the Dauphin I will keep my state, be like a king, and show my sail of greatness when I do rouse me in my throne of France. For that have I laid by my majesty, and prodded like a man for working days. But I will rise there with so full a glory that I will dazzle all the eyes of France. Yea, strike the Dauphin blind to look on us. And tell the pleasant prince, this mock of his hath turned his balls to gunstones, and his soul shall stand sore charged for the wasteful vengeance that shall fly with them. For many a thousand widows shall this his mock, mock out of their dear husbands, mock mothers from their sons, mock castles down. And some are yet ungotten and unborn that shall have cause to curse the Dauphin's scorn. This lies all within the will of God to whom I do appeal, and in whose name tell you the Dauphin I am coming on to venge me as I may, and to put forth my rightful hand in a well-hallowed cause. So get you hence in peace. And tell the Dauphin his jest shall savor but of shallow wit. When thousands weep, more than did laugh at it, convey them with safe conduct. Say well. <laughs> this was a merry message. We hope to make the sender blush at it. Therefore, my lords, omit no happy hour that may give furtherance to our expedition. For we have now no thought in us but France, save those to God that run before our business. Therefore, let our proportions for these wars be soon collected, and all things thought upon that may with reasonable swiftness add more feathers to our wings. For God before, we'll chide this dolphin at his father's door. Now all the youth of England are on fire, that silken dalliance in the wardrobe lies. Now thrive the armorers, and honor's thought reigns solely in the breast of every man. They sell the pasture now to buy the horse, following the mirror of all Christian kings, with winged heels as English mercuries. For now sits expectation in the air, and hides a sword from hilts unto the point with crowns imperial, crowns and colonists, promised to Harry and his followers. French, advised by good intelligence of this most dreadful preparation, shake in their fear, and with pale policy seek to divert the English purposes. O oh, England, model to thy inward greatness, like little body with a mighty heart, what mightst thou do that honor would thee do, were all thy children kind and natural? But see, thy fault France hath in thee found out a nest of hollow bosoms, which he fills with treacherous crowds. And three corrupted men, one Richard, Earl of Cambridge, and the second Henry, Lord Scroop of Massum, and the third, Sir Thomas Gray, Knight of Northumberland, have for the guilt of France, oh, guilt indeed, confirmed conspiracy with fearful France, and by their hands this grace of kings must die. If hell and treason hold their promises, ere he take ship for France and in Southampton, Linger your patience on, and we'll digest the abuse of distance. Force a play. The sum is paid. The traitors are agreed. The king is set from London.
Well, met Corporal Nim. Well, good morrow, Lieutenant and Bardo. What? An ancient pistol and you friends, yeah? But for my part, I care not. I say little. But when time shall serve, there shall be smiles. Oh, certainly it that... is, Corporal. And he is married to know quickly. And certain tis. She did you wrong, for you were truth plight to her. I cannot tell. Things must be as they may. The men may sleep, and they may have their throats about them at that time, and some say knives have edges. Here comes ancient pistol, and his wife, good corporal. Offer nothing here. How now, mine host pistol? Hush, take. Call a Sammy host! No, by this hand I swear I scorn the term! No, shall my no keep lodger! Oh, but the day, lady! Now we shall see! Well, for adultery and murder coming! Oh, William Shoggle! Oh, my own pistols! You must come to my master! And you, hostess! He's very sick and would to bed. Good part off. Put thy nose between his cheeks and do the office of a warming pan. Oh, oh faith, he's very ill. By my troth. He'll hear the crow a put in one of these days. The king has killed his heart. Good husband, come in presently. The king hath run bad humours on the night, and that's the even of it. Nim, thou hast spoke the right. His heart is fractured and corroborate. The king is a good king. But that must be as it may. He passes some humours and careers. Let us go and condole the night. For Lampkin, we will live. Yeah. The scene is now transported, gentles, to Southampton. There is the playhouse now. There must you sit. And thence to France, where we convey you safe and bring you back. Charming the narrow seas to give you gentle pass. For if we may, we'll not offend one stomach with our play. For oh, God, his grace is bold to trust these traitors. They shall be apprehended by and by. How oh, smooth and even they do bear themselves, as if allegiance in their bosom sat, crowned with faith and constant loyalty. The king hath note of all that they intend by interception, which they dream not of. Now sits the wind fair, and we will aboard. My lord of Cambridge. And my kind lord of Matham. And you, my gentle knight, give me your thoughts. Think you not that the powers we bear with us shall cut their passage through the force of France, doing the execution and the act for which we have in head assembled them? No doubt, my liege, if each man do his best. We doubt not that. Uncle of Exeter, enlarge the man committed yesterday that railed against our person. We consider it was excess of wine that set him on. And on his more advice, we pardon him. That's, That's mercy, but too much security. Let him be punished, sovereign, lest example breed by his sufferance more of such a kind. Oh, let us yet be merciful. We'll yet enlarge that man. Though Cambridge Stroop and Gray, in their dear care and tender preservation of our person, would have him punished. Now, to our French causes, who are the late commissioners? I won, my lord. Your highness bade me ask for it today. So did you me, my liege. And I, my royal son. Then, Richard, Earl of Cambridge, that is yours. They're yours, Lord Stroop of Massam. And Sir Knight Gray of Northumberland, this same is yours. Read them, and know, I know your worthiness. My Lord of Westmoreland and Uncle Exeter, we will aboard tonight. <laughs> My honor, gentlemen, what see you in those papers that you lose so much complexion? I do confess, my fault, and do submit me to your highness mercy. To which we all appeal. The mercy that was quick in us but late by your own counsel is suppressed and killed. You must not dare for shame to talk of mercy. See you, my princes and my noble peers, these 
English monsters, my lord of Cambridge here hath for a few light crowns lightly conspired to kill us here in Hampton. To the which this night, no less for bounty bound to us than Cambridge's hath likewise sworn. But oh, what shall I say to thee, Lord Scroop? A cruel, ingrateful, savage, and inhuman creature. Thou that didst bear a key of all my counsels that knew the very bottom of my soul. Oh, how hast thou with jealousy infected the sweetness of affiance? I will weep for thee. For this revolt of thine, methinks, is like another fall of man. Their faults are open. Arrest them to the answer of the law, and God acquit them of their practices. I arrest thee of high treason by the name of Richard, Earl of Cambridge. I arrest thee of high treason by the name of Henry, Lord Scroop of Mesham. I arrest thee of high treason by the name of Thomas Gray, Knight of Northumberland. Hear your sentence. You have conspired against our royal person, joined with an enemy proclaimed, and from his coffers received the golden earnest of our death. Touching our person, seek we no revenge. Yet we our kingdom's safety must so tender whose ruin you have sought, that to her laws we do deliver you. Get you therefore hence, poor miserable wretches, to your death. The taste whereof God of his mercy give you patience to endure, and true repentance of all your dire offenses. Bear them hence. Now, lords, for France! The enterprise whereof shall be to you as us, like glorious. We doubt not now, but every rub is smoothed on our way. Then forth, dear countrymen, let us deliver our puissance into the hand of God, putting it straight in expedition. Clearly to see the signs of war advance. No king of England, if not king of France. Sweet on your husband, let me bring you to stay. No, for my manly heart doth yearn. Bardolph, be blithe. Name, rouse thy vaunting veins. Boy, bristle thy courage up. For Falstaff, he is dead, and we must yearn, therefore. Would I were with him? Where's the Mary is? Is there in heaven or in hell? No, sure he's not in hell. He's in Arthur's bosom. If ever man went to Arthur's bosom. I made a finer end. And went away and... Has it been any Christian child? A party just even between twelve and one. Even at the turning of the tide. For after I saw him fumble with the sheets and play with flowers and smile upon his fingers' ends, I knew there was but one way. For his nose was as sharp as a pen and a babbled of green feel. And now, Sir John, quoth I, top man, be of good cheer. So I cried out, God, 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 three or four times. 
Now I, to comfort him, pity me should not think of God. I hope there was no need for him to trouble himself with any such thoughts yet. So I bade me lay more clothes on his feet. Put my hand into the bed and felt them. They were as cold as any stone. And I felt up to his knees. And so, upward and upward. And all was as cold as any stone. They say cried out of sack. Aye, that it did. And women? No, that it did not. Yes, that he did. And said they were devils incarnate. He could never abide carnation. It was a colour he never liked. Mm. He said once the devil would have him about women. He did in some sort indeed. Handle women. But then it was romantic. And talked of the awe of Babylon. <laughs> Do you not remember? He saw a flea stick upon Bardolph's nose. And he said it was a black soul burning in hell fire. Oh, uh, fuel's gone at maintain that fire. That's all the riches I got in his service. Shall we shop? The king will be gone from Southampton. Come, let us go. My love, give me thy lips. Go, clear thy crystals. You fellows in arms, let us to France, like horse leeches, me boys, to suck, to suck the very blood, to suck. And that's but unwholesome food, they say. Touch her soft mouth and march. <laughs> I cannot kiss. That is the humour of it. But at you. Let Zephyr appear. Keep close, I thee command. Farewell. with full power upon us, and more than carefully it us concerns to answer royally in our defences. Therefore the Dukes of Berry and of Bretagne, of Brabant and of Orléans shall make forth, and you, Prince Dauphin, with all swift dispatch to line and you repair our towns of war with men of courage and with means defended. My most redoubted father, it is most meet we arm us against the foe. Therefore I say it is meet we all go forth to view the sick and feeble parts of France. And let us do it with no show of fear. No, with no more than if we heard England were busied with a Whitson Morris dance. For, my good liege, she is so idly kinged, her scepter so fantastically borne by a vain, giddy, shallow, humorous youth, that fear attends her not. Oh, peace, Prince Dauphin. You are too familiar with this king. Question your grace, the late ambassador, with what great state he heard their embassy. How well supplied with noble counsellors, how modest an exception. And with all her terrible inconstant resolution. Think we, King Harry, strong. And princes, look you strongly armed to meet him. The kindred of him hath been fleshed upon us. And he is bred out of that bloody strain that haunted us in our familiar paths. Witness our too much memorable shame when Cressy battle fatally was struck. And all our princes captive by the hand of that black name, Edward. Black Prince of Wales. This is the stem of that victorious stock. And let us fear the native mightiness and fate of him. Ambassadors from Harry, King of England, who crave admittance to your majesty. You'll give them present audience. Go and bring them. You see, his chase is hotly followed, friend. Turn head and stop the suit. For coward dogs most spend their mouths, and what they seem to threaten runs far before them. Good my sword. Take up the English short, and let them know of what a monarchy you are the head.
From our brother England. From him? And thus he treats your majesty. He wills you in the name of God Almighty that you divest yourself and lay apart the borrowed glories that by gift of heaven, by law of nature and of nations, longs to him and to his heirs. Namely, the crown. <laughs> or else what follows? Bloody constraint. For if you hide the crown, even in your hearts, there will he rake for it. Therefore in fierce tempest is he coming, in thunder and in earthquake like a Jove, that if requiring fail, he will compel. This is his claim, his threatening, and my message. Unless the Dauphin be in presence here, to whom expressly I bring greeting too. For us, we will consider of this further. Tomorrow shall you bear our full intent back to our brother England. For the Dauphin, I stand here for him. What to him from England? Scorn and defiance, slight regard, contempt, and anything that may not misbecome the mighty standard that he prize you at. Thus says my king. And if your father's highness do not in grant of all demands at large sweeten the bitter mock you sent his majesty, he'll call you to so hot an answer of it that caves and woomy voltages of France shall chide your trespass and return your mock in second accent of his ordinance. Say, if my father render fair return, it is against my will. For I desire nothing but odds with England. To that end, as matching to his youth and vanity, I did present him with the Paris balls. You'll make your Paris louvre a shake for it. Tomorrow shall you know our mind. At full. Dispatch us with all haste. Lest that my king come here himself to question our delay. For he is footed in this land already. You shall be soon dispatched with fair conditions. A night is but small breath and little pause to answer matters of this consequence. Thus with a matted wing our swift scene flies in motion of no less celerity than that of thought. Suppose that you have seen the well-appointed king at Hampton Pier embark his royalty and his brave fleet with silken streamers, the young Phoebus Fanny. Play with your fancies and in them behold upon the hempen tackle ship boys climbing. Hear the shrill whistle which doth order give to sounds confused. Behold the threatened sails. Born with the invisible and creeping wind, draw the huge bottoms through the furrowed seas, breasting the lofty surge. Oh, do but think you stand upon the rivage, and behold a city upon the inconstant billows dancing. For so appears this fleet majestical, holding due course to Harfleur. Follow, follow, grapple your minds to sternage of this navy, and leave your England a dead midnight still. Guarded with grandsires, babies, and old women. Either past or not arrived at Pith and Puritan. For who is he whose chin is but enriched with one appearing hair that will not follow these culled and choice-drawn cavaliers to France? Work. Work your thoughts. And therein see a siege. Behold the ordnance on their carriages with fatal mouth gaping on girded half -lure. Suppose the ambassador from the French comes back. Tells Harry that the king doth offer him Catherine, his daughter, and with her to dowry some petty and unprofitable dukedoms. The offer likes not, and the nimble gunner with Linscott now the devilish cannon touches, and down goes all before them. Still be kind, and eke out our performance with your mind. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiff of the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard favor rage. Then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let it try through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow overwhelm it as fearfully as does a galling rock or hang and jutty his confounded base, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide. Hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. <laughs> on, on, you noblest English, whose blood is fit from fathers of warproof. Fathers who, like so many Alexanders, have in these parts, from morn till evening,
cleave and fought and sheathed their swords for lack of argument. <laughs> Dishonor not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. <laughs> Be copy now to men of grosser blood and teach them how to war. And you, good yeoman, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not. For there is none of you so mean or base, but hath not noble luster in your eye. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slip, straining upon the start, the game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge cry, God for Harry, England, and since you're... To them all three. But all they three, though they would serve me, could not be man to me. For indeed, three such antics do not amount to a man. To steal anything and call it purchase. Bardolph stole a loot case, bought it twelve leagues and sold it for three acres. Nim and Bardolph are sworn brothers in filching, and they would have me as familiar with men's pockets as their gloves or their handkerchiefs. Which makes much against my manhood if I should take from another's pocket to put into mine. I must leave them and seek some better service. Their villainy goes against my weak stomach, and therefore whoop, I must cast it up. Uh, Captain Flewellyn, you must come presently to the mine. Well, I don't. Talk. Yes, the Duke of Gloucester would speak. To the mine? Oh, come here. Tell you that joke. It is not so good to come to the mines. For look, you. War's mines is not according to the disciplines of the wars. The concavities of it is not sufficient. The adversary, look, Joe, he's digged himself four yards under the countermines. Oh, Jesus. I think I'd blow up all if there's no better directions. Uh, well, the Duke of Gloucester, to whom the order of the siege is given, is altogether directed by an Irishman. Oh, it's Captain McMorris, is it not? Mm, I think it be. Oh, Jesus, he's an ass. He has no more directions in the true disciplines of the wars, look, Joe. The Roman disciplines, then, is a puppy dog. Ah. Uh, here it comes now. Ah, and Captain Jamie, the Scots captain, with him. Oh, captain Jamie is a marvellous valorous gentleman, that's certain. And a man of great expedition and knowledge in the ancient wars. Hey, good day, Captain Flewell. Good day to your worship, Captain Jamie. And now, Captain McMorris, have you quit the mine? Uh, have these pioneers given all? Christ, is it done? The work is given over and the trumpets sound the retreat. I would have blown up the town, so Christ save me, Lord, in an hour. Oh, it is ill done. It is ill done. By my hands, it is ill done. Uh, Captain McMorris, I beseech you now. I will have safe me look you uh, a few disputations with you, as partly touching or concerning the disciplines of the wars, uh, the Roman wars. And by way of argument, look you and uh, friendly communication. Uh, shall be very good, good faith, good captains, mate. Uh, but I shall quit you with good leave, as I may pick occasion. <laughs> that shall I marry. It is no time to discourse, so quite save me. The day is hot, and on the weather, and the wars, and the kings, and the dukes. It's no time to discourse. The town is besieged, and the trumpet call us for the breach, and we talk and be quite do nothing. It is shame for us all. For God's sake, it is shame to stand still. It is shame. By my hands, it is shame. Uh, there's throats to be cut and works to be done, and there's nothing done to. Christ save me. By the mass. Uh, these eyes of mine set themselves to slumber. I'll take good service or a lick of the ground. Ah, uh, uh, I'll go to death. And I'll pay it as valorously as I may. And that shall I surely do. And that's the brave on the land. Uh, Mary, um. <clears throat> I would uh, full fain hear some question between you twain. Uh, Captain McMorris, I think, look, you know, uh, under your correction, there's not many of your nation. My nation? What is my nation? Is a villain and a bastard and a knave and a rascal. What is my nation? Who talks of my nation? Oh, 
Take the matter otherwise than is meant, Captain McMorris. Peradventure, I shall think you do not use me with that affability as in discretion. You ought to use me, look you now. Being as good a man as yourself, both in the disciplines of the war, in the derivation of my birth, and in other particular case, I do not the know you so good a man as myself, Captain Quite to me on cut off your head and bow. You will mistake each other. <laughs> Sounds of Polly. <laughs> Captain McBody! Yes, sir. Unless for a better opportunity to be required of you, I will be so bored to tell you. And I know the discipline of the war. Never end. How yet resolves the governor of the town? This is the latest power we will admit. Therefore, to our best mercy, give yourselves. For like to men proud of destruction, defy us to our worst. For as I am a soldier, a name that in my thoughts becomes me best, ah. if I begin the battery once again, I will not leave the half-achieved half-fleur till in her ashes she lie buried. Therefore, you men of half-fleur, Take pity of your town and of your people, whilst yet my soldiers are in my command. What say you? Will you yield and this avoid? Or guilty in defense be thus destroyed? Our expectation hath this day an end. The Dauphin, whom of succors we entreated, returns us that his powers are not yet ready to raise so great a siege. Therefore, great king, we yield our town and lives to thy soft mercy. Enter our gates. Dispose of us and ours. For we no longer are defensible. Open your gates! <laughs> Go you and enter Harper. There remain, and fortified strongly against the French, use mercy to them all. For us, dear uncle, the winter coming on and sickness growing upon our soldiers, we will retire to Calais. Tonight in Harfleur will we be your guest. Tomorrow, for the march, are we addressed? J'étais pris, m'enseigner. Il faut que j'apprenne à parler. Comment euh, appelez-vous euh, Lama en anglais. Lama Elle est appelée de Hand. De Hand. Et les doigts Les doigts Oh, ma foi, j'oublie les doigts. Oh, mais je m'en souviendrai. Les doigts, les doigts. Je crois qu'ils sont appelés de Fingers. Oui, c'est ça. The fingers. La main, the hand. Les doigts, the fingers. Oh, je pense que je suis le bon écolier. J'ai gagné deux mots d'anglais. Oh. Oh. Comment appelez-vous les ongles Ah, les ongles, nous les appelons the nez. The nez. Hmm. Écoutez, dites-moi si je parle bien. The hand, the fingers et the nez. Eh bien, dit madame, il est fort bon anglais. Dites-moi l'anglais pour le bras. The arm, madame. The arm. Et le coude. Delbo. Delbo mm, Je m'en fais la répétition de tous les mots que vous m'avez appris dès le présent. Oh, il est trop difficile, madame, comme je pense. Excusez-moi, Alice, écoutez. The arm, the finger, the nail, the arm, the bilb. 
Elba. Elba, madame. Oh, Seigneur Dieu, je m'en oublie. C'est Elba. Oh, comment appelez-vous le col De Nick, madame. De Nick Et le montant Euh... De Tim. De Tim. Le col de Nick, le montant de Tim. Oui. Oh. Sans votre honneur, en vérité, vous prononcez les mots aussi bien que les natifs d'Angleterre. Oh, je ne doute pas de prendre par la grâce de Dieu et un peu de temps. Mais n'avez-vous pas déjà oublié ce que je vous ai enseigné Non. Je reciterai vos preuves de mon dire un petit peu grâce, mais... Le, 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 next, madame. Le mail... Le armazi. Si... Il est bon. Sans votre honneur de Elbo. Oh, on s'y dit, je dis Elbo. Le nick est de film. Oh, comment t'appelez-vous euh, le pied et la robe? Le foot, madame. Et le crown. Le foot et le crown. Oh, oh, Seigneur Dieu. Ce sont nos deux sont mauvais. Corruptif, gros et imputé qu'un nom les dames d'honneur, tout j'ai. Je ne voudrais prononcer ces mots devant le Seigneur de France, pour tous les mondes. Oh, non, je vous étais con. Mais moi, je reciterai une autre voix, mais laissons ensemble. The arm, the finger, nails, the arm, the elbow, nick, the tin, the foot, the con. Excellent, madame. C'est assez pour une fois. Allons nous abîmer. To certain we have passed the river Somme. And if you be not fought with all, my lord, let us not live in France. Let us quit all and give our vineyards to our barbarous people. Normans, but bastard Normans. Norman bastards. More de ma vie if ye march unfought with all. But I will sell my dukedom to buy a slobbery and a dirty farm in that nooksotten isle of Albion. Get out of that tie. Where have they this metal? Faith and honor our madame mock at us. Plainly say our metal is bred out. They will give their bodies to the lust of English youth to new store France with bastard warriors. Where is Montjoy the herald? Speed him hence. Let him greet England with our sharp defiance. Up, princess, and with spirit of honor edged more sharper than your swords, high to the field. Shall deliberate High Constable of France. You do some Bourbon, Orléans, Rambieux, Berry, Alençon, Brabant, Bar, Faucambridge, Foix, Lestral, Boussicot, and Charolois. For your great seats now quit you of great shames. Bar, Harry England, that sweeps through our land with pennons painted in the blood of our fleur. Go down upon him. You have power enough. And in a captive chariot into Rouen, bring him our prisoner. Miss Dauphin, you shall remain with us in Rouen. Not so, I do it, did you, Majesty? Miss Dauphin, be his patient. You shall remain with us. Now forth, Lord Constable and Princes all. And quickly bring us word of England's fall. <laughs> Captain Crowden, coming from the bridge. Oh, I assure you. There's very excellent service is committed at the bridge. Duke of Exeter, safe. Oh. The Duke of Exeter is as magnanimous as Magamemnon. He's not going to be praised and blessed any other in the world. He keeps the bridge most valiantly and with excellent discipline. Oh, no. The king is coming. And I will speak with him presently from the bridge. God bless your majesty. Oh, no, Sir Ellen. Came in from the bridge? Aye, so please, your majesty. The Duke of Exeter is very gallantly maintained the bridge. The French has gone off, look you. And the Duke of Exeter is now master of the bridge. Oh. What men have you lost, Sir Ellen? Oh, Harry, for my part, I think the Duke has lost never a man. Oh. No. Oh. Oh, save one that's like to be hanged for a bit of church. <laughs> <laughs> On battle, if your majesty know the man. 
His face is all bubblegums and welts and knobs and flames of fire. And his lips blows and his nose is like a cola fire. Sometimes blue and sometimes red. <laughs> but his nose is executed and his fire's out. We would have all such offenders so cut off. And we give express charge that in our marches through the country there be nothing compelled from the villages, nothing taken but paid for. None of the French upbraided or abused in disdainful language. For when lenity and cruelty play for a kingdom, the gentler gamester is the soonest winner. <laughs> You know me by my habit. Well, then I know thee. What shall I know of thee? My master's mind. Unfold it. Thus, says my king, say thou to Harry of England, though we seemed dead, we did but sleep. Advantage is a better soldier than rashness. Tell him we could have rebuked him at half <laughs> But that we thought not good to bruise that injury till it was full right. Now we speak upon our cue, and our voice is imperial. England shall repent his folly, see his weakness, and admire our sufferance. Bid him, therefore, consider of his ransom, which must proportion the losses we have borne, the subjects we have lost, the disgrace we have digested. For our losses, his exchequer is too poor. For the effusion of our blood, the muster of his kingdom too faint a number. And for our disgrace, his own person kneeling at our feet but a weak and worthless satisfaction. To this, add defiance. And tell him for conclusion, he hath betrayed his followers, whose condemnation is pronounced. So far, my king and master, so much my office. What is thy name? I know thy quality. Montjoy. Thou dost thy office fairly. Turn thee back and tell thy king. I do not seek him now, but could be willing to march on to Callis without impeachment. For to say the sooth, though tis no wisdom to confess so much unto an enemy of craft and vantage, my people are with sickness much enfeebled. My numbers lessened. And those few I have almost know better than so many French. <laughs> when they were in health, I tell thee, Harold, I thought upon one pair of English legs did march three Frenchmen. <laughs> Yet God forgive me that I do brag thus. This your heir of France has blown this vice in me. I must repent. Go therefore, tell your master. Here I am. My ransom is this frail and worthless trunk. My army but a weak and sickly guard. Yet, God before, tell him, we will come on. Though France himself and such another neighbor stood in our way. As for thy labor, Montjoy. So bid thy master will advise himself. If we may pass, we will. If we be hindered, we sell your tawny ground with your red blood discolour. So, my joy, fare you well. The sum of all our answer is but this. We do not seek a battle as we are. Yet as we are, we say we will not shun it. So tell your master. I will deliver, sir. Thanks to your highness. <laughs> I hope they will not come upon us now. We are in God's hand, brother, not in theirs. March to the bridge! It now grows towards night. Beyond the river we'll encamp ourselves. And on the morrow, bid them march away. <laughs> the best armor of the world. What a good day. 
You have an excellent armor. But let my horse have his due. To the best horse of Europe. <sighs> Will it never be morning? My Lord of Orleans, my Lord High Constable, you talk of horse and armor. You are as well provided of both as any prince in the world. What a long night is this. I will not change my horse for any of the treads but of four patterns. When I bestride him, I saw I am a hawk. This is the color of the nutmeg. And to the heat of the ginger, it is a beast for Perseus. It's pure air and fire. And the dull elements of earth and water never appear in him. He is indeed a horse. And all other jades you may call beasts. Indeed, my lord, it is a most absolute and excellent horse. It is the prince of Porphyrys. His neigh is like the bidding of a monarch. His countenance enforces homage. No more, cousin. Nay, the man hath no wit that cannot from the rising of the lark to the lodging of the lamb vary deserved praise on my Porphyry. I once writ a sonnet in his praise and began thus. Wonder of nature. I've heard a sonnet begin so to one's mistress. Then did they imitate that which I composed to my courser, for my horse is my mistress. Nay, but methought yesterday your mistress shrewdly shook your back. <laughs> <laughs> my Lord Constable, the armor that I saw in your tent tonight, are those stars or suns upon it? Stars, my lord. Some of them will fall tomorrow, I hope. And yet my sky shall not want. <sighs> Will it never be day? I will trot tomorrow a mile. My way shall be paved with English faces. Who will go to Hazard with me for twenty prisoners? You must first go yourself to Hazard, ere you have them. It is midnight. I'll go arm myself. The Dauphin longs for morning. He longs to eat the English. I think he will eat all he kills. <laughs> <laughs> My Lord High Constable, the English lie within fifteen hundred paces of your tents. Who hath measured the ground? The Lord Grand Prey. A valiant and most expert gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what it would do uh... Alas, poor Harry of England, he longs not for the dawning as we do. What a wretched and peevish fellow is this King of England. <laughs> to mope with his fat brain followers so far out of his knowledge. That island of England breeds very valiant creatures. <laughs> the mastiffs are of unmatchable courage. <laughs> Foolish curs that run winking into the mouth of a Russian bear and have their heads crushed like rotten apples. Oh. You may as well say that's a valiant flea that dare eat his breakfast on the lip of a lion. <laughs> just, just. And the men do sympathize with the mastiffs in robustious and rough coming on, leaving their wits with their wives. And then give them great meals of beef and iron and steel. They'll eat like wolves and fight like devils. Aye, but these English are shrewdly out of beef. When shall we find tomorrow they have any stomachs to eat and none to fight? <laughs> Now it is time to arm. Come, shall we about it? It is now two o'clock. But let me see, by ten, we shall have each. A hundred Englishmen? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
now entertain conjecture of a time when creeping murmur and the pouring dark fills the wide vessel of the universe. From camp to camp, through the foul womb of night, the hum of either army stilly sounds. That the fixed sentinels almost receive the secret whispers of each other's watch. Fire answers fire. And through their paley flames, each battle sees the other's umbered face. Steed threatens steed in high and boastful nays, piercing the knight's dull ear. And from the tents, the armorers accomplishing the knights with busy hammers closing rivets up, give dreadful note of preparation. The country cocks to crow. The clocks to tow. And the third hour of drowsy morning night. of their numbers and secure in soul, the confident and over-lusty French do the low-rated English play at dice and chide the crippled, tardy-gated knight, who, like a foul and ugly witch, doth limp so tediously away. The poor, condemned English, like sacrifices by their watchful fire, sit and inly ruminate the morning's danger. Their gesture sad, investing lank, lean cheeks and war-worn coats, presented them unto the gazing moon. So many horrid ghosts. Oh now, who will behold the royal captain of this ruined band, walking from watch to watch, from tent to tent, let him cry praise and glory on his head. For forth he goes and visits all his host, bids them good morrow with a modest smile, and calls them brothers, friends, and countrymen. Upon his royal face there is no note how dread an army hath enrounded him, nor that he dedicate one jot of color to the weary and all-watched night, but freshly looks and overbear the taint with cheerful semblance and sweet majesty that every wretch, pining and pale before, beholding him, plucks comfort from his looks. A largest universal, like the sun, his liberal eye doth give to everyone, thawing cold fear, that mean and gentle all, behold, as may unworthiness define, a little touch of Harry in the night. <laughs> And so our scene must do the battle fly, where, oh, for pity, we shall much disgrace with four or five most vile and ragged foils, right ill-disposed in brawl ridiculous. The name of Agincourt. Yet sit and see, minding true things by what their mockeries be. Brother John Bates, is not that the morning which breaks yonder? Ah, uh, I think it be. We have no great cause to desire the approach of day. We see yonder the beginning of the day. I think we shall never see the end of it. Who goes there? The friend. Under what, Captain Savier? Under Sir Thomas Erpingham. A good old commander and a most kind gentleman. I pray you. What thinks he of our estate? Even as men wrecked upon a sand would look to be washed off at the next tide. He hath not told his thought to the king. No. Well, it is not meet he should. For though I speak it to you, I think the king is but a man, as I am. The violet smells to him as it does to me. For therefore, when he sees reason of fears, his fears, out of doubt, be of the same relish as ours are. He may show what outward courage he will, but I believe as cold a night as it is, he can wish himself in Thames up to the neck. Though I would he were, and I'd buy him at all adventures, and we were quit there. But, Matros, I speak my conscience of the king. I think he would not wish himself 
Anywhere but where he is. Then I would he were there alone. Then should he be sure to be ransomed? Many a poor men's lives saved. I dare say you love him not so ill to wish him here alone. Howsoever you speak this to feel other men's mind. Methinks I could not die anywhere so contented as in the king's company. His cause being just and his quarrel honorable. Well, that's more than we know. Uh -huh. Or more than we should see, God. But we know enough if we know we are the king's subjects. If his cause be wrong, our obedience to the king wipes the crime of it out of us. But if the cause be not good, the king himself hath a heavy reckoning to make. When all those legs and arms and heads chopped off in a battle shall join together at the latter day and cry all, We died at such a place, some swearing, some crying for the surgeon, some upon their wives left poor behind them, some upon the debts they owe, some upon their children rawly left. I'm afraid there are a few die well that die in a battle. For how can they charitably dispose of anything when blood is their argument? Now, if these men do not die well, it'll be a black matter for the king that led them to it, whom to disobey were against all proportion of subjection. So, if a son that is by his father sent upon merchandise to sinfully miscarry upon the sea, the imputation of his wickedness by your rule should be imposed upon his father that sent him. But this is not so. The king is not bound to answer for the particular endings of his subjects, nor the father of his son, for they purpose not their deaths when they purpose their services. Oh, but when they Besides, purpose... there's no king. His cause, never so spotless. If it come to the arbitrament of swords, can try it out with all unspotted soldiers. Well, every subject's duty is the king's, but every subject's soul is his own. Oh, it is certain. Every man that dies ill, ill upon his own head, the king is not to answer for it. I do not desire he should answer for me. I determined to fight lustily for him. I myself heard the king say he would not be ransomed. Oh, uh, he said so, to make us fight cheerfully. But when our throats are cut, he may be uh, ransomed, and uh, we know the wiser. Uh, if ever I live to see it, I'll never trust his word after. You pay him, then. <laughs> That's a perilous shot out of an elder gun that a poor and a private displeasure can do against a monarch. You may as well go about to turn the sun to ice with fanning in his face with a peacock's feather. He'll never trust his word after it, Coach. Uh, a foolish uh, saying. Do this something too round. I should be angry with you if the time were convenient. Be friends, you English fools. Be friends. We have French quarrels enough. You could tell her to reckon. Upon the king, let us our lives, our souls, our debts, our careful wives, our children, and our sins lay on the king. We must bear all. Oh, hard condition. To inborn with greatness. What infinite heart's ease must kings neglect? that private men enjoy. And what have kings that privates have not too? Save ceremony, save general ceremony. And what art thou, thou idol ceremony? What kind of god art thou that sufferest more of mortal griefs than do thy worshippers? What drinks thou oft instead of homage sweet but poison flattery? Oh, be sick, great greatness, and bid thy ceremony give thee cure. Canst thou, when thou commandst the beggar's knee, command the health of it? No, oh, thou proud dream, that placed so subtly with a king's repose. I am a king that find thee, and I know. Tis not the balm, the scepter, and the ball. The sword, the mace, the crown imperial, the intertissued robe of gold and pearl, a farcid title running for the king, the throne he sits on, 
nor the tide of pomp that beats upon the high shore of this world, not all these laid in bed majestical, can sleep as soundly as the wretched slave, who with a body filled and vacant mind gets him to rest, crammed with distressful bread, never sees horrid night, child of hell, but like a lackey from the rise to set, sweats in the eye of Phoebus, and all night sleeps in Elysium. Next day after dawn doth rise, and help Hyperion to his horse, and follows so the ever-running year with profitable labor to his grave. And but for ceremony, such a wretch, winding up days with toil and nights with sleep, had the forehand and vantage of a king. <laughs> My lord, the nobles jealous of your absence seek through the camp to find you. Good old knight. Collect them all together at my tent. I'll be before thee. I'll do, my lord. O oh God of battles, Steal my soldiers' hearts. Possess them not with fear. Take from them now the sense of reckoning, lest the opposed numbers pluck their hearts from them. Not today, O Lord, and not today, think not upon the fault my father made encompassing the crown. I, Richard's body, have interred new. And on it have bestowed more contrite tears than from it issued forced drops of blood. Five hundred poor I have in yearly pay, who twice a day their withered hands hold up towards heaven to pardon blood. And I have built two chantries where the sad and solemn priests sing still for Richard's soul. More will I do. Yet all that I can do is nothing worth, since that my penitence comes... After all, imploring pardon. My liege. My brother Gloucester's voice. Aye, I know thy errand. I will go with thee. The day, my friends, and all things stay for me. Now, my lord constable. How come our steeds for present service, nay? Mount them and make incision in their hides that our hot blood may spin in English eyes and doubt them with superfluous courage. Now, what will you have them weep our horses' blood? How shall we then behold their natural tears? The English are in battle, do French fear. To horse, you gallant princes, strike to horse. Do but behold yon poor and starved band. And your fair show shall suck their souls from them, leaving them but the shales and half the men. <laughs> they have said their prayers and they stay for death. <laughs> shall we go send them dinners and fresh suits and give their fasting horses provender and after fight with them? I stay but for my guard. On to the field. Come, come away. The sun is high and we are well. Well, where is the king? The king himself is rode to view their battle. Your fitting men may have full three score thousand. There's five to one. Beside, they all are fresh. God's arms strike with us. It is a fearful odds. God be with you, princes. All answer my charge. Farewell, good Salisbury. And good luck go with thee. Farewell, kind lord. Fight valiantly today. He is as full of valor as of kindness. Princely in both. Oh, that we know had here but one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland. Now, my fair cousin. 
If we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. Rather proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host. But he which hath no stomach for this feast, let him depart. His passport shall be made, and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home shall stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, Tomorrow is St. Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispin's day. Old men forget. It all shall be forgot, but he'll remember. With advantages, <laughs> what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth, those household words. Harry, the king, Bedford, and Exeter, Warwick, and Talbot, Salisbury, and Gloucester be in their flowing cups, freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son. And Crispin, Crispian, shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. But we in it shall be remembered. We few. We happy few. We band of brothers. For he this day that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he now so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves a curse. They were not here. And hold their manhood cheap. Whiles any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin Day. Oh, no, restore yourself with speed. The French are bravely in their battle center will with all expedience charge on us. All things are ready if our minds be so. Then it's the man whose mind is backward now. <laughs> with more help from England, God. God will, my liege, would you and I alone without more help could fight this royal battle. Why, now thou hast unwished five thousand men, <laughs> which likes me better than to wish us one. You know your places? God be with you all. Once more I count on earth thee, King Harry, for thy ransom thou wilt now compound, before thy most assured overthrow. Who hath it be now? The constable of France. I pretty bear my former answer back. Bid them achieve me and then sell my bones. Good God! Why should they mock poor fellows thus? The man that once did sell the lion's skin while the beast lived was killed with hunting him. <laughs> <laughs> now many of our bodies shall, no doubt, find native graves upon the which I trust shall witness live in brass of this day's work. And those that leave their valiant bones in France Dying like men, though buried in your dunghills, they shall be tamed for there. The sun shall greet them and draw their honors reaching up to heaven, leaving their earthly parts to choke your climb. The smell whereof shall breed a plague in France. Let me speak proudly. We are but warriors for the working day. Our gainers and our guilt are all besmirched with rainy marching in the painful field. There's not a piece of feather in the host. Good argument, I hope we will not fly. <laughs> and time hath worn us into slovenry. 
But by the mass, our hearts are in the trip. Come thou no more for ransom, gentle herald. They shall have none, I swear, but these my bones. Which if they have as I will leave them, shall yield them little. Tell the constable. I shall, King Harry. And so fare thee well. Thou never shalt hear, herald, any more. <laughs> <laughs> Fear thou once more come again for ransom. My lord, most humbly on my knee I beg the leading of the Baywood. Take it, brave York. Now, soldiers, march away! And how thou pleasest God, dispose the day. Come to thee for charitable license that we may wander o'er this bloody field to book our dead and then to bury them, to sort our nobles from our common men. For many of our princes woe the while lie drowned and soaked in mercenary blood. So do our vulgar drench their peasant limbs in blood of princes, and their wounded steeds fret, fret rock deep in gore, and with wild rage yerk out their armed heels of their dead masters, killing them twice. Oh, give us leave, great king, to view the field with safety. And dispose of their dead bodies. I'd, I'd tell thee truly, Harold. I know not if the day be ours or no. The day is yours. Praise it be God, and not our strength for it. What is this castle called that stands hard by? They call it Agin Court. Then call we this the field of Agin Court? Fought on the day of Crispin Crispianus. Our herald go with him. Bring me just notice of the numbers dead on both our parts. Your grandfather, a famous memory, and please your majesty, and your great uncle Edward, the Black Prince of Wales, as I have read in the chronicles, fought the most brave battle here in France. They did, Fluellen. Your majesty, it is very true. And if your majesty has remembered of it, 
A Welshman did good service in a garden where leeks to grow. Wherein there leeks in a man with cups. Which, as your majesty know to this hour, is an honorable badge of the service. And, uh, do you believe your majesty takes no scorn to wear a leek upon St. David's Day? I wear it for a memorable honor. For I am Welsh, you know, good countryman. All the water in the wild cannot wash your majesty's Welsh blood out of your body, I can tell you that. God bless it and preserve it, as long as it pleases grace. Uh, and your majesty, too. The Ochoval, the own, good my countrymen. It is who I am, your majesty's countrymen. I care not to know it. I will confess it to all the world. I need not to be ashamed of your majesty, so long as your majesty is an honest man. <laughs> God keep me so. Father Harold, the dead numbered. Here is the number of the slaughtered French. This note doth tell me of 10,000 French that in the field lie slain. Charles de la Breth, High Constable of France. Jacques of Châtillon, Admiral of France. The Master of the Crossbows, Lord Rambure. Great Master of France, the brave Sir Guichard Dauphin. John, Duke of Alençon. Anthony, Duke of Brabant, the brother to the Duke of Burgundy. And Edward, Duke of Bar. Here was a royal fellowship of death. Where is the number of our English dead? Edward, the Duke of York. The Earl of Suffolk. Sir Richard Ketley. David Gam, Esquire. None else of name, and of all other men, but five and twenty. Oh, God! Thy arm was here, and not to us, but to thy arm alone ascribe we all. Take it, God, for it is only thine. It is wonderful. Come, go in procession to the village, and be a death proclaimed through our host to boast of this, or take that praise from God which is his only. Is it not lawful and please your majesty to tell how many is killed? Yes, for it. But with this acknowledgement that God fought for us. I, by my conscience, he did us great good. Let there be sung. Non nobis and te deum, the dead with charity enclosed in clay. And then, to Calais. One now from France arrived, more happy men. Vouchsafe to those that have not read the story that I may prompt them, and of such as have, I humbly pray them to admit the excuse of time, of numbers, and due course of things, which cannot, in their huge and proper life, be here presented. Now we bear the king toward Callis, 
Grant him there, there seen, heave him away upon your winged thoughts athwart the sea. Behold the English beach, pales in the flood, with men, with wives and boys, whose shouts and claps outvoice the deep-mouthed sea, which, like a mighty whiffler for the king, seems to prepare his way. So let him land, and omit all the occurrences whatever chanced, till Harry's back return again to France. There must we bring him, and myself have played the interim by remembering you tis past. So, Brooke abridgment, and your eyes advance, after your thoughts, straight back again to France. <laughs> Why wear you your meat today? Occasions and causes, why and where for all things, Captain Gower? I will tell you, as my friend. The rascally, scold, beckly, lousy, bragging here, pistol, whom you, yourself, and all the world, not to be no better look you now than a fellow of no merit. He has come to me and brings me bread and salt. Yesterday, look you now. And bid me eat my leek. Was there in the place where I could not be more contented with him? But I will be so bold as to wear it in my cup till I don't see him once again. And I'll give him a little piece of my desires. Well, here it comes. Swelling like a turkey cock. It's no matter for his swellings, nor his turkey cocks. Oh, God bless you, Engine Pistol. You scurvy lousy knave. Oh, God bless you. Art thou, Bedlam, dost thou first base children to every fold up carcass, fatal web? Hence, I am qualmish at the smell of leek. Oh, I beseech you heartily, you scurvy, lousy nerve. At my desires and my requests and my petitions. To eat, look you, this leek. <laughs> because, look you, you do not love it. Or your affections and your appetites and your digestions do not agree with it. I would desire you to eat it. Not for Ted Wallander and all his goats. <laughs> there is one book for you. Will you be so good, stall knave, as he did? Beast Trojan, thou shalt die! <laughs> when God's will is, I would desire you to live in the meantime and to eat your victuals. Come! No! There's some spot for it! Captain, you have astonished. Oh, I say I will make him eat some part of my leaf, or I will feed his head for a day! Bite, I'll you. Go for your green wound, your broken coxcomb. Must I bite? Yes, certainly, and out of doubt and out of question, too. <laughs> and ambiguous it is. Oh, my, this week I will most horribly revenge. Oh, I eat, I eat, I swear. Eat, I pray you. <laughs> will you have some more sauce to your leek? <laughs> Not enough. Oh, 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 Quiet, thy cudgel. Now to see, I eat. Must go <laughs> do your score, name after it. <laughs> oh, no. Nay, I pray you. Throw none away. Oh, the skin's good for your broken coxcomb. <laughs> when you do take occasion to see leeks thereafter, I pray you. Mark at him! That's all. <laughs> good, my The leeks is good. Oh, no! Oh, you! Here is a groat to heal your pet. Uh, me, a groat? Yes, certainly, and in truth you shall take it. Or I have another leak in my <laughs> I shall take no clearly to revenge. If I do owe you anything, I will pay you in cudgels. <laughs> You shall be a woodmonger and buy nothing of me but cudgels. God be with you and keep you and heal <laughs> <laughs> your pet. <laughs> All hell shall stir for this. Go, go, Leata. Counterfeit, cowardly knave. What's thou? What's thou mock at an ancient tradition founded upon an honorable respect and worn as a memorable trophy of predeceased valor? Uh, and dare not about your deeds in any of your words? I have seen you gleeking and galling at this gentleman twice or thrice. You thought, because he could not speak English um, in the native garb, he could not handle an English cudgel. You find it otherwise. And uh, henceforth, let a Welsh correction teach you good English condition. Very well. The fortune blew the hoosier with me now. News have I that my Nell is dead in the spittle. Of a malady of France. And there my rendezvous is quite cut off. Oh, do I wax. And from my weary limbs, honor is cut. Well, bored I'll turn. And something lean to cut purse a quick hand. To England will I steal. And there, I'll steal. 
and patches will I get for these cudgel scars, and swear I got them in the Gallia Wars. <laughs> To this meeting, wherefore we are met. Unto our brother France and to our sister, health and fair time of day. Joy and good wishes to our most fair and princely cousin, Catherine. And as a branch or member of this royalty by whom this great assemblage is contrived, we do salute you, Duke of Burgundy, and Princes French, and peers, help to you all. I joy as are we to behold your face, most worthy brother England, fairly met. So are you princes English, every one. My duty to you both, on equal love, great kings of France and England, that I have labored with all my wits, my pains, and strong endeavors to bring your most imperial majesties unto this bar and royal interview. Your mightiness on both parts best can witness. Since then, my office hath so far prevailed that face to face and royal eye to eye you have congreted. Let it not disgrace me if I demand before this royal view what rub or what impediment there is, why that the naked, poor, and mangled peace, dear nurse of arts, fences, and joyful births, should not in this best garden of the world our fertile France put up her lovely visage. Alas, she hath from France too long been chased, and all her husbandry doth lie on heaps, corrupting in its own fertility. Her vine, the merry cheer of the heart unpruned, dies. Her hedges even pleached, like prisoners wildly overgrown with hair, put forth disordered twigs. Her fallow leaves, the darnel, hemlock, and rank fumitory doth root upon, while that the coat her rusts that should deracinate such savagery. Her even mead, that erst brought sweetly forth the freckled cowslip, burnet, and green clover, wanting the scythe, all uncorrected, rank, conceives by idleness. And nothing teems but hateful docks, rough thistles, kexes, burrs, losing both beauty and utility. Even so our houses and ourselves and children have lost, or do not learn for want of time, the sciences that shall become our country but grow like savages. As soldiers will, let nothing do but meditate on blood, to swearing and stern looks, diffused attire, and everything that seems unnatural. Which, to reduce into our former favor, you are assembled. And my speech entreats, that I may know the let why gentle peace should not expel these inconveniences, and bless us with her former qualities. If Duke of Burgundy, you would the peace whose... Want gives growth to the imperfections that you have cited. You must buy that peace with full accord to all our just demands. The king hath heard them, to the which, as yet, there is no answer made. Well then, the peace which you before so urged lies in his answer. I have but with a cursory eye or glanced the article. Is it your grace to appoint some of your counsel presently to sit with us once more with better heed to re-survey them? We will suddenly pass our accept and peremptory answer. Brother Michel. Uncle Exeter, Brother Clarence, you, Brother Gloss, to go with the king. Will you first sister go with the princes or stay here with us? Our gracious brother, I will go with them. Haply a woman's voice may do some good when articles too nicely urged be stood on. Yet leave our cousin Catherine here with us. She is our principal demand. She has good leave.
fair Catherine and most fair. Will you? Will you vouchsafe to teach a soldier terms such as may enter at a lady's ear and plead his love suit to her gentle heart? Your mercy shall mock at me. I cannot speak your England. Oh, fair Catherine, if you will love me soundly with your French heart, I'll be glad to hear you confess it brokenly with your English tongue. You like me, Kate? Pardonnez-moi, I cannot tell what is like me. An angel is like you, Kate, and you are like an angel. Que dis-tu que je suis semblable à les anges? Oui, vraiment. Son photographe est ainsi, dit-il. I said so, dear Kate, and I must not blush to affirm it. Bon Dieu, les langues des anges sont pleines de tromperies. <laughs> What is she, fair one? That the tongues of men are full of deceit. Oui. That the tongues of the man is be full of deceit. That is the princess. Oh, the princess is the better English woman. Faith, Kate, my wooing is fit for thy understanding. I'm glad thou can speak no better English, for if thou couldst, thou wouldst find me such a plain king that thou wouldst think I'd sold my farm to buy my crown. <laughs> I know no ways to mince it in love but directly to say I love you. Then if you urge me further than to say, do you, with faith, I wear out my suit. Come, give me your answer, if faith do, and so, clap hands of a bargain. How say you, lady? Ah, ah. So, votre honneur, me understand well. Mary, if you were to put me to verses or to dance for your sake, Kate, why you undid me? If I could win a lady at leapfrog, or by vaulting into my saddle, with my armor on my back. Or if I might buff it for my love, or bound my horse for her favors, I could lay on like a butcher, and sit like a jack and apes, never off. But before God, Kate, I cannot look greenly, nor gasp out my eloquence, nor I have no cunning in protestation, only downright oaths, which I never used till urged, nor never break for urging. If I can flub a fellow of this temper, Kate, Whose face is not worth sunburning, who never looks in his glass for love of anything he sees there. Take me. If not, the faith of thee that I shall die is true. But for thy love, by the Lord, no. But yet I love thee, Kate. Oh, while thou livest, dear Kate. Take a fellow of plain and uncoined constancy, for these. Fellows of infinite tongue that do rhyme themselves into ladies' favors. They do always reason themselves out again. A good leg will fall, a straight back will stoop, a black beard will turn white, a curled pate will grow bald, a fair face will wither, a full eye will wax hollow, but a good heart, Kate, is the sun and the moon, or rather the sun and not the moon, for it shines bright and never changes and keeps its course truly. If thou wouldst have such a one, take me. Take me, take a soldier. Take a soldier. Take a king. Oh, what is thou then to my love? Speak, my fair. And fairly, lady. Is it possible that... I should love the enemy of France. Well, no, Kate, it's not possible that you should love the enemy of France. But in loving me, Kate, you would love the friend of France. For I love France so well that I will not part with a village of it. And, Kate, when France is mine and I am yours, then yours is France and you are mine. I cannot do what is that. No, Kate. <laughs> Well, I will tell thee, in 
and French, which I'm sure will hang upon my lips like a newly married wife about her husband's neck, hardly to be shook off. Ah. Je can't. Uh, 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 sur la possession de France, et quand vous avez la possession de moi. Let me see, what's then? Then it's been my speed. Oh. Donc! Votre est France et vous êtes mien. It is easy for me, Kate, to conquer the kingdom is to speak so much more French. I shall never move the French and listen to laugh at me. Sur votre honneur, le français que vous parlez, il est meilleur que l'anglais lequel je parle. No, Kate, it's not Kate. But Kate, can't thou understand thus much English? Can't thou love me? I cannot tell. Can any of your neighbors tell Kate? I ask. I know that I love this thing. And tonight, when you come into your closet, you will question this gentlewoman about me, and Kate, you will to her dispraise those parts in me that you love with your heart. But good Kate, mock me mercifully. The rather gentle princess, because I love thee cruelly. Shall not thou and I, between St. Denis and St. George, compound a boy, half French, half English, that shall go to Constantinople and take the turf by the beard? Shall we not? What says thou, my fair flower de luce? La plus belle Catherine du monde. Mon très cher et divin déesse. Oh, de Your Majesty, a post French enough to deceive the most fragile demoiselle that is in France. Now fire upon my false French and by my honor in true English. I love thee, Kate. By which honor I dare not swear thou lovest me, yet my blood begins to flatter me that thou dost. Notwithstanding the poor and untempering effect of my visage. Now, beshrew my father's ambition. He was thinking of civil wars when he got me. But, Kate, the elder I wax, the better I shall appear. <sighs> Put off your maiden blushes. Avouch the looks of your heart with the looks of an empress. Take me by the hand and say, Harry of England, I am thine. Which word thou shalt no sooner bless mine ear with all than I will say unto thee aloud, England is thine, Ireland is thine, France is thine, and Henry Plantagenet is thine. Come, your answer, in broken music, for thy voice is music and thy English is broken. Therefore, Queen of all, Catherine. Break thy mind to me in broken English. Wilt thou have me? That is, as it shall please our roi, mon père. Uh, it will please him well, Kate. Shall please him, Kate. Then it shall also content me. Upon that, I kiss your hand and call you my queen. No! Oh, oh listen, Monsignor! Listen, listen, Monsignor! I will kiss your lips, Kate! No, 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 no! No, no, no! Madam, I interpreter, what says she? That it is not the fashion for the ladies to pass. Oh, I cannot tell what is baiser in English. To kiss. Your Majesty, entendre better que moi. That it is not a fashion for the maids in France to kiss before they are married. Would she say? Really, why not? Why not? Oh, Kate. Nice customs, courtesy to great kings. You and I cannot be confined within the weak list of the country's fashion. We are the makers of manners, Kate. 
and the liberty that follows our faces stops the mouth of all fine folks, as I will do yours. Therefore, patiently and yielding, There is witchcraft in your lips, Kate. There is more eloquence in a sugar touch of them than in the tongues of the French council. <coughs> Here comes your father. God save your majesty. My royal cousin, teach you our princess English. I would have her learn, that cousin, how perfectly I love her, and that is good English. Shall Kate be my wife? Take her, fair son. And from her blood raise up issue to me. That the contending kingdoms of France and England, whose very shores look pale with envy of each other's happiness, may cease their hatred. In this dear conjunction plant neighborhood and Christian-like accord in their sweet bosoms. That never war advance his bleeding sword twixt England and fair France. Amen. 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 Welcome, Kate. And bear me witness all that here I kiss her as my sovereign queen. God, the best maker of all marriages, combine your hearts in one, your realms in one. As man and wife being two are one in love, so be there twixt your kingdom such a spousal, that never may ill office or fell jealousy, which troubles off the bed of blessed marriage, thrust in between the paction of these kingdoms to make divorce of their incorporate needs. That English may as French, French Englishmen, receive each other. God speak this, Amen. Amen. Prepare we for our marriage. On which day, my Lord of Burgundy, we'll take your oath and all the peers for surety of our league. Then shall I swear to Kate and you to me. And may our oaths well kept and the prosperous be. Thus far, with rough and all unable pen, our bending author hath pursued the story. In little room confining mighty men, mangling by start the full course of their glory. Small time, yet in that small, most greatly lived this star of England. Fortune made his sword, by which the world's best garden he achieved and of it left his son, imperial lord. Henry the Sixth, in infant bands, crowned king of France and England, did this king succeed. Whose state, so many had the managing, but they lost France, and made his England bleed, which oft our stage hath shown. And for their sake, in your fair minds, let this acceptance 